Hi, my name is Lisa Tucker and I work at the St. Charles City County Library. Today I am reading pages 253 through 310 of Dreamland Burning for You. Rowan. Rowan finally succumbs to the pain of the accident and is wearing a neck brace when James comes over to see her. He has the title to her house, which turns out to be a complicated but interesting read. The land her house sits on was once signed over by President Fillmore in 1852 to the Muscogee Creek Nation before Oklahoma was even a state. From there, the Muscogee tribe gave the land to a freedman named America Manuel. As Rowan and James keep reading the history of her family's house, they discover that America Manuel never lived there but leased it to a farmer and then to the Anchor Oil Company. The house changed hands eight times before Stanley and Catherine bought the lot in 1920 for $25,000. They only lived there for two years before Rowan's great-great-grandfather, Rowan, purchased the house in 1922. Rowan is relieved, knowing that her family's time in the house is one full year after the receipt from the Victrola and the coin that was found on the body. The evidence points to William Tillman being the body buried in her yard, but Rowan isn't so sure. There's no evidence of him in Tulsa after 1922, and she's almost certain he wasn't black. They determined that his father must have been white, otherwise he wouldn't have been allowed to own a shop on Main Street. After finding William's family on Ancestry, they figure out the mystery of how a Victrola store owner could afford this house. William's mother was one of the 2,228 Osage Indian tribe members gifted oil money during the boom in Tulsa. James remembers hearing how Osage women were murdered during that time in order for others to claim their fortunes. But the two discover Catherine Tillman didn't die until 1976 in Pawhuska, not Tulsa, which means Stanley didn't kill her. Later, Rowan gets her first call from a reporter. She hangs up quickly and talks to none of them. As she watches news report after news report about Jerry Randall and Arvin, she's angrier than ever at how Arvin is presented by the media. William. Vernon comes into the Victrola store and tells William and Cleet that he's been deputized to curb the uprising coming from Greenwood. He wants Cleet and William to go with him to, quote, flush out the bad ones out of Tulsa once and for all, end quote. William thinks of all the people from Greenwood he knows and says no to Vernon. He's angry and knocks over an expensive Victrola, bullying William into saying yes. But as soon as he's outside, he fakes needing shotgun shells and goes back in for Joseph. Finding him, the two attempt to escape in the truck, past Vernon and Cleet. Soon they are being chased by Vernon's Cadillac through the streets, driving and careening all over the place. They finally escape, barely, by crossing the tracks right before the train comes through, leaving Vernon on the other side. Driving through Greenwood, William is struck by all the people he sees fleeing, especially all the children. Joseph spots his friend Gideon and asks him if he's seen his ma or Ruby. He tells him that three white men took his mom while she was searching for Ruby. All he knows is she was alive when they took her. Joseph is upset by, but understands he needs to find Ruby right away. With tears in his eyes, he tells William that his prom is the next day and there, quote, won't be no colored folk dancing in Tulsa tomorrow night, end quote. Rowan. On a whim, Rowan calls Geneva and asks about updates to the investigation. To her surprise, there is. The pistol's original serial number was traced to a gun issued by the U.S. Army, a Colt M1911. They determined the gun's issue date to be between 1916 and 1917. The holster had the initials V period F period on them, but Bob, the friend of Geneva who helped with this part of the investigation, says the initials were modified at some point and thinks that it could have been R period F period. A man named Raymond Fisher from Decatur, Georgia. Raymond also happened to be black, went AWOL after his mother died and was never found again. Rowan didn't attend Arvin's candlelight vigil, even though part of her wanted to. Instead, she spent it outside thinking. Her fond father finds her there and tells her the news that the district attorney's office isn't charging Jerry Randall, calling it self-defense. The next day is the funeral. After sitting in the car and watching, Rowan decides to go to the gravesite. There aren't many people there, but True invites her to the reception at Mama Ray's house. Rowan quickly figures out Mama Ray isn't True's mom, but the one who helped him on the path to sobriety. 
The reception is filled with people who knew Arvin, and she finds herself in a room for the first time, surrounded by people who look like her. Arvin's aunt, Tilda, arrives and talks to Rowan about being there when Arvin died. Then she offers her a piece of her famous pie, a recipe that took 40 years to get from her friend Obel. She claims it's the best peach pie Rowan will ever have. William. William takes Joseph to his house to look for Ruby, but doesn't find her there. As they are leaving to go to the Dreamland Theater, they hear voices and light shining outside. Two white men are outside the house, but leave Joseph's alone because they don't think anything of value is there. Hearing his neighbors cry for help, Joseph and William devise a plan to leave the house and help. William pretends he's caught Joseph and walks out of the house with his gun pointed at him. The Tylers, the elderly couple next door, are walking out in their night clothes as one of the men pushes the old man down, slapping him and eventually using the butt of his rifle to smash his temple. When his wife, Mrs. Tyler, cries out and falls to the ground, he kicks her in the back. William concocts a lie about someone paying men $5 for every Negro caught. After a tense exchange, the two boys leave and William and Joseph help the Tylers into the truck. Driving through the streets of Greenwood, William comes across a dead man in the street. The burns on his body are from being dragged behind a car with a noose around his neck. William decides to move the man off of the street and Joseph helps. Driving further, William turns south and comes upon nine white men with shotguns and makeshift deputy labels on their shirts. He tells them he's caught the Negroes, but the men aren't satisfied, especially since he is alone. They pull the three out of the back of the truck and use a pocket knife to cut a slit up the back of Joseph's shirt. One of the men takes a belt with KKK on the handle and says, string him up, boys, leaving William to watch in horror. Rowan. Rowan finds more requests for interviews on her phone, but deletes them all. She and her mom talk briefly about the case, and Rowan promises to take it easy that day. Doctor's orders. Disregarding the order to stay off of the screen, Rowan digs deeper into Raymond Fisher's history. She verifies that he is listed as Negro, as is his mom. According to his draft card, he dislocated his shoulder at age 16, had blue eyes, was tall and stout. Another characteristic about him was being light-skinned. Rowan plays on the internet more, making the mistake of reading the discussion comments about Arvin's accident. They are filled with racist comments of groups that Rowan didn't even know existed. Then James shows up and takes her on a spontaneous road trip. Their road trip takes them to Pawhuska, to a nursing home that has a patient by the name of Joe Tillman. Joe is eager and happy to see them both and ask what they'd like to know about his family. When he learns that Rowan lives in his grandmother's old house, he thinks he knows why they are there. Rowan and James are surprised when he asks if they found a body.